There's nothing better than a good beer at the right time. There just isn't. Be it a cold winter day or a hot summer day, when you get the right beer in your hand and then in your mouth, there's nothing better than that. There just isn't. There aren't ways to describe it. It's, you know, you could go back to, to Proust's you know, expansion on the Madeleine. It's like a sip of a certain beer can bring you back in time. You know, I can, I can drink a crappy Pabst Blue Ribbon, and I'll remember when I was 14 and we got a 12-pack of it. But I also can remember, you know, the Scottish Ale my dad and I made that one time when I was 12. And then when I get something similar to it, it'll snap me right back to being in my basement with my dad. It's a weird, very convoluted, complex product that can change your perception of reality, at least briefly. Brendan O'Neill, I'm a head brewer. I grew up home brewing with my dad, though I started brewing when I was about six. And I've been doing it the better part of my life with a couple breaks here and there. Our founder is a guy named Matt Steinberg. He had the idea for the initial three styles and the company logo, and he's the guy who got business loan and got all the equipment you see behind me in place. So he, he's our founder. And then um, took on a, a couple rounds of investors and then we've all sort of joined together to, to run the thing since. My name is Paul Silverman. I'm chairman of New Jersey Beer Company. I invested in the brewery about two and a half years ago, a year after the brewery opened up, and, and helped it to grow to what it is now. It's doubling and tripling in volume every year. It's great growth, and, and it kind of parallels the growth of craft beer throughout the country. It's much more popular than, than the old-fashioned beers that have been around for a long time. People like local organic and, and, and natural ingredients into the beers. And, and knowing Brendan and Dave, the two brewers that make all of our beer, it's a, you know, it's a story to every glass of beer. Chris Walsh, and I'm the owner of River Horse Brewing Company. I bought it with another, uh, with, my, with my business partner, Glenn Bernabeo, in August of 2007. The brewery was in existence since 95 or 96, but we purchased it from the previous owners and the founders. We were investment bankers, we were a financial professional, and we were looking for uh, something to do, something, uh, a new job. We had sold our firm. We didn't actually set out looking for a brewery. We looked for a company that, um, a product that we understood in an industry that had the wind at its back, uh, close enough to get to every day. We had like five or six criteria and it hit every one. So it wasn't like we were having a midlife crisis and went out and bought a brewery. It wasn't like that. The fundamentals of the business just made sense. And hippos are hilarious. So I think that was a contribution as well. The hippo came with the brewery, but the, the story of the hippo is that um, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, the hippo is always represented around the brewing process. It doesn't represent the brewing process specifically. It represents sustenance and fertility. So back then, it was basically a malt bomb, so it was like drinking uh, you know, a loaf of bread and fertility, well, we'll keep a PG-13. We, we can all figure out what that means. So. We've grown tremendously. We grew to the point that we actually had a move last year to this facility, which is about two and a half times our previous facility, uh, and much higher ceilings. So this has the capacity to be about 10 times the size of what we were in Lambertville. We are centrally located in the middle of New York on one end, Philadelphia on the other, and eight and a half million people in between that are financially well-heeled. So, you know, we think we'll contribute a lot to that. Our vision would be when people think of New Jersey's craft brewery is for it to be us. The Amtrak brewery for, you know, the Northeast Corridor Amtrak brewery for lack of a better term. It's not ambitious, that's the goal. My name is Tim Lappin and I am a tour guide here at Brooklyn Brewery. So our brewmaster is named Garrett Oliver. He's written a couple books about beer that have circulated worldwide. The Brooklyn brewery name has become uh, kind of stable as an ambassador for Brooklyn and we've uh, increase our operation here in Williamsburg about 10 times the production we used to do here. Our distribution has increased a lot over the past few years, especially internationally. The market's grown every single year for us. We are opening a brewery in Sweden in the month, which is the first American craft brewery to operate uh, a craft beer overseas. Uh, so that's huge for us. And uh, so we've just seen distribution overseas, distribution in the States go up every single year, as long as doing a lot new beers every single year as well. So as Brooklyn's popularity as a destination has grown, so as the breweries, we like to kind of use that to go to new places, hold concerts, have uh, beer events, tastings, 
and kind of spread the world of craft beer, get people coming from every country in the world into the brewery, which is really exciting. And their scenes of craft beer have grown where they are from as well. 2001, when we first opened, New Jersey was behind the bell curve of beer appreciation. They, in fact, didn't even really know what a craft beer was. So we opened up introducing something that everybody was saying, well, why do you need more beers? We already have plenty of them. So the industry was born, and um, New Jersey has slowly but surely come around, and we've been a part of that growth, and we've been coming out with additional beers, very easy to drink session beers. A session beer means that you, from the time you sit to the time you're finished drinking beer, you can stay with the same beer. Whereas most of the breweries around here, or most of the craft breweries, make a designer beer. It's bigger, it's more powerful, it's beautiful beer, but you can't drink very many of them. So we stayed with the session beer idea to make, uh, to make the everyday beer drinker who defects from the big three be able to come over to an all malt and enjoy it, the beer without, without uh, trying to knock you down. We got picked up by distributors as we started seeing us in the marketplace. They wanted to distribute us. They have salespeople and they get the beer out there. We go to all the shows we possibly go to. Now it's changed considerably because back then there were very few shows. Now there's shows every single weekend. So we go to what we can, we get the name out, we advertise in different publications, we um, word of mouth, we have tours here every Friday. We bring people in to uh, taste the beers. We do whatever we can to get the name out there. And we have clowns <laughs> working here. This country used to have a lot of small breweries, either countywide or townwide, that all sort of fell apart during Prohibition. And then the people who had the money left over from either their illicit businesses during Prohibition or re figuring their manufacturing plants to make other things like soda, they kept themselves alive and at least kept their space. Those are the people who took over the market leading into the Second World War and that's where we sort of ran into this 70s beer problem where we have, you know, Paps, Strohs, Rheingold, maybe a little bit of Ballantyne around here, and then, you know, Bud Miller Coors. And right now we're still looking at almost one out of every two beers bought in this country is still Budweiser. You know? um, and the, you know, the, the other 1.9 that's left, like that's probably split between Miller and Coors and then a fraction of that turns into a craft beer drinker. A big problem for a lot of breweries in the 80s was distribution. You make beer, you sell it to a distributor, they sell it to a bar. So you got a three tiered system, this middle tier might not care about what you make. And that's really difficult. If someone selling your product doesn't give a crap, it's really difficult for you to move it. So, that was a big problem for the, the company right off the bat, changing people's minds about what beer was. For years, everyone thought beer was that golden pilsners and lagers, that's what they thought American beer was. So when the lager came out in 1988, it was a much darker lager and pretty hoppy, kind of bitter, which was a new kind of phenomenon. So people, that kind of changed people's heads, what beer was gonna be. Now people think the lager's a kind of tame beer, you gotta remember in 88, this was totally revolutionary. The first craft beer that I had was Pete's Wicked Ale. It was the first beer that actually had flavor and had a funny name. So, you know, that was sort of a long time ago. Um, and then, you know, craft beer sort of petered out a little bit. And then this is the sort of second wave. Like in the 90s, you know, a lot of breweries went out of business. And this is sort of the second coming of stuff. And part of it is, is fueled by what's happened in a lot of other categories in terms of consumer products or specifically beverages. You couple that with um, the change that people have in their tastes. And once we change as a culture, we don't really change back. So you start getting introduced to these beers and they, you're not gonna go back to drinking um, you know, macro-made beer. NPR, which is a radio station I listen to frequently, uh, coined this profusion of beer uh, the American craft beer renaissance. What I think is cool about it is that you're, you're making beer more to the taste of what people like, right? We know that you know, everybody has their own unique palate and so I think with all these beers, now everybody can get into it. Everybody can enjoy beer. You know, I've had many uh, interactions with people who have never had craft beer who are like, oh, I hate beer. And then you ask them, well, what were the beers that you had? And it's not to bash the big beer companies, right? You know, yeah, I, don't, I don't mean to sound pretentious, but usually they say the main ones, the big companies that advertise on TV who have the money to do that. You can always find a beer 
that even people who say I hate beer or turned off to beer, that they'll like. Because there's just, there's so many. And I think that's the great thing about like what they're calling the American craft beer renaissance. I think we're at, a, we're at the time when the pendulum, the business pendulum is swinging back. People have been inundated since they were kids and since generations before by the big breweries that have spent quadrillions of dollars making sure you don't try anything else. Well now those big breweries aren't even American companies anymore and people are starting to decide, well wait a minute, I'd rather drink fresh, drink local, drink less. And that's the, that's the uh, mentality that the craft beer industry is growing on. I can produce better, fresher beers than anybody else can around here. And then uh, um, Budweiser, Coors and Miller, I don't know if I'm allowed to say them, their beers aren't fresh. Their beers are shipped in from wherever they happen to have breweries. So you want good fresh beers, you want good local food, you want to drink local, you want to live Jersey, drink Jersey. That's what the craft industry is all about. Beer is local. That's the whole thing, for the most part. And that 92% is shrinking, and the 8% is growing. It's becoming um, more a part of our culture. Like, the beer culture is just growing. And that 8% that drinks that beer is never going to go back.